Section number 10 of Light Science for Leisure Hours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Light Science for Leisure Hours by Richard A. Proctor. Floods in Switzerland. Recently, see date of essay, we have witnessed a succession of remarkable evidences of nature's destructive powers. The fires of Vesuvius, the earth throes of the sub-equatorial Andes, and the submarine disturbance which has shaken Hawaii, have presented to us the various forms of destructive action which the earth's subterranean forces can assume. In the disastrous floods which have recently visited the alpine canons of Switzerland, we have evidence of the fact that natural forces which we are in the habit of regarding as beneficent and restorative may exhibit themselves as agents of the most widespread destruction. I have pointed out elsewhere how enormous is the amount of power of which the rain cloud is the representative and in doing so I have endeavored to exhibit the contrast between the steady action of the falling shower and the energy of the processes of which rain is in reality the equivalent. But in the floods which have lately ravaged Switzerland, we see the same facts illustrated, not by numerical calculations or with the results of the philosophical experiments, but in action and that action taking place on the most widely extended scale. The whole of the southeastern, or as it may be termed, the alpine half of Switzerland has suffered from these floods. If a line be drawn from the Lake of Constance in the northeast of Switzerland to the Col de Balm in the southwest, it will divide Switzerland into two nearly equal portions and scarcely a canton within the eastern of these divisions has escaped without great damage. The cantons which have suffered most terribly are those of Tessin, Grissons, and St. Gall. The St. Gothard, Splungen, and St. Bernardine routes have been rendered impassable. Twenty-seven lives were lost in the St. Gothard Pass, besides horses and wagons full of merchandise. It is stated that on the three routes upwards of eighty persons perished. In the village of Loridio alone no less than fifty deaths occurred. So terrible a flood has not taken place since the year 1834. Nor have the cantons of Uri and Valais escaped. From Unterwalden we hear that the heavy rains which took place a fortnight ago have carried away several large bridges, and many of the rivers continue still very swollen. I have already described how enormous the material losses are which have been caused by these floods. Many places are under water, others in ruins are absolutely destroyed. In Tessin alone the damage is estimated at 40,000 pounds sterling. A country like Switzerland must always be liable to the occurrence, from time to time, of catastrophes of this sort. Or rather, perhaps, we should draw a distinction between the two divisions of Switzerland referred to above. Of these, the one may be termed the mountain half, the other the lake half of the country. It is the former portion of the country which is principally subject to the dynamical action of water. A long continued and heavy rainfall over the higher lands cannot fail to produce a variety of remarkable effects. Where the arrangement of mountains and passes, hills and valleys and ravines is so complicated, there are places where a large volume of water can accumulate until the barriers which have opposed its passage to the plains burst under its increasing weight, and then follow these destructive rushes of water which sweep away whole villages at once. It is, in fact, the capacity of the Swiss mountain region for damming up water, far more than any other circumstance, 
which renders the Swiss floods so destructive. And then it must be remembered that there are at all times suspended over the plains and valleys which lie beneath the alpine ranges enormous masses of water in the form of snow and ice. Although in general these suffer no changes but those due to the partial melting which takes place in summer and the renewed accumulation which takes place in winter. Yet when heavy rains fall upon the less elevated portions of the alpine snow, they not only melt the snow, but more rapidly than the summer sun would do, but they wash down large masses which add largely to the destructive power of the descending waters. The most destructive floods which have occurred in Switzerland have usually been those which take place in early summer. The floods which inundated the plains of Martigny in 1818 were a remarkable instance of the effects which result from the natural damming up of large volumes of water in the upper parts of the Alpine hill country. The whole of the valley of Bangs, one of the largest of the lateral branches of the main valley of the Rhone above Geneva, was converted into a lake in the spring of 1818 by the damming up of a narrow pass into which avalanches of snow and ice had been precipitated from a lofty glacier overhanging the bed of the river Drance. The ice barrier enclosed a lake no less than half a league in length and an eighth of a mile wide, and in places two hundred feet deep. The inhabitants of neighboring villages were terrified by the danger which was to be apprehended from the bursting of the barrier. They cut a gallery seven hundred feet long through the ice, while the waters had as yet risen but to a moderate height, and when the waters began to flow through this channel, its course was deepened by the melting of the ice, and at length nearly half the contents of the lake were safely carried off. It was hoped that this process would continue and the country be saved from the danger which had been so long impending over it. But as the heat of the weather increased, the central part of the barrier slowly melted away until it became too weak to bear the enormous weight of water which was pressing against it. At length it gave way, so suddenly and completely that all the water which remained in the lake rushed out in half an hour. The downward passage of the water illustrated in a very remarkable way the fact that the chief mischief of floods is occasioned when the water is checked in its outflow, for it is related that, in the course of their descent, the waters encountered several narrow gorges, and at each of these they rose to a great height, and then burst with new violence into the next basin, sweeping along forests, houses, bridges, and cultivated land. Along the greater part of its course the flood resembled rather a moving mass of rock and mud than a stream of water. Enormous masses of granite were torn out of the sides of the valleys and whirled for hundreds of yards along the course of the flood. M. Escher relates that one of the fragments thus swept along was no less than sixty yards in circumference. At first the water rushed onwards at a rate of more than a mile in three minutes, and the whole distance, forty-five miles, which separates the valley of Banks from the lake of Geneva, was traversed in little more than six hours. The bodies of persons who had been drowned in Martingay were found floating on the farther side of the lake of Geneva, near Vevery. Thousands of trees were torn up by the roots, and the ruins of buildings which had been overthrown by the flood were carried down beyond Martingay. In fact, the flood at this point was so high that some of the houses in Martingay were filled with mud up to the second story. Beyond Martingay, the flood did but little damage, as it here expanded over the plain and was reduced in both depth and velocity. From the Daily News for October 20th, 1868.
End of section 10. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 11 of Light Science for Leisure Hours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Light Science for Leisure Hours by Richard A. Proctor. A Great Tidal Wave. During the last few days, anxious questionings have been heard respecting the next spring tides. A certain naval officer who conceives that he can trace in the relative positions of the sun and moon the secret of every important change of weather has described in the columns of a contemporary the threatening significance of the approaching conjunction of the sun and the moon. He predicts violent atmospheric disturbances, though in another place he tells us merely that the conjunction is to cause unsettled weather, a state of matters to which we in England have become tolerably well accustomed. But people are asking what is the actual relation which is to bring about such terrible events. The matter is very simple. On October 5th, the moon will be new. In other words, if it were not for the brightness of the sun, we should see the moon close by that luminary on the heavens. Thus the sun and moon will pull with the combined effect upon the waters of the earth, and so cause what are called spring tides. This, of course, happens at the same time of every new moon, but sometimes the moon exerts a more effective pull than at other times and the same happens also in the case of the sun and on october fifth it happens that both the sun and the moon will give a particularly vigorous haul upon the earth's waters as regards the sun there is nothing unusual every october his pull on the ocean is much the same as in preceding octobers but october is a month of high solar tides and for these reasons, in September, as everyone knows, the sun crosses the equinoctial, and other things being equal, it would be when, on the equinoctial, that his power to raise a tidal wave would be greatest. But other things are not equal, for the sun is not always at the same distance from the earth. He is nearest in January, so that he would exert more power in that month than in any other, if his force depended solely on distance. As matters actually stand, it would be obvious that, at some time between September and January, the sun's tidal power would have a maximum value. Thus, it is that October is a month of high solar tidal waves. But it is the lunar wave which will be most effectively strengthened at the next spring tide. If we could watch the lunar tide wave alone, instead of always finding it combined with the solar wave, we should find it gradually increasing, and then gradually diminishing, in a period of about a lunar month, and we should find that it was always largest when the moon looked largest, and vice versa. In other words, when the moon is in perigree, the lunar wave is largest. But then there is another consideration. The lunar wave would vary according to the moon's proximity to the equinoctial, and, other things being equal, would be the largest when the moon is exactly opposite the Earth's equator. If the two effects are combined, that is, if the moon happens to be in perigee and on the equinoctial at the same time, then, of course, we get the largest lunar tide wave we can possibly have. Now, this largest lunar wave occurs at somewhat long intervals, because the relation on which it depends is one which is, to speak, exceptional. Still, the relation does recur, and with a certain degree of regularity. When it happens, however, it by no means follows that we have a very high tide, 
because it may occur when the tides are near neap in other words when the sun and moon exert opposing effects the largest lunar wave cannot stand the drain which the solar wave exerts upon it at the time of neap tides nor would the large lunar tidal wave produce an exceptionally high tide even though it were not the time of a neap or were tolerably near the time of spring tides only when it happens that a large lunar wave combines fully with the solar wave do we get very high tides and when in addition to this relation we have the solar wave nearly at maximum we get the highest of all possible tides this is what will happen or all but happen on the october fifth next the combination of circumstances is almost the most effective that can possibly exist but after all high tides depend very importantly on other considerations than astronomical ones most of us remember how a predicted high tide some two years ago turned out to be a very moderate or if we may use the expression a very one-horse affair indeed because the winds had not been consulted and exerted their influence against the astronomers a long succession of winds blowing offshore would reduce a spring tide to a height scarcely exceeding the ordinary neap on the other hand if we should have a long succession of westerly winds from the atlantic before the approaching high tide it is certain that a large amount of mischief may be done in some of our riverside regions as for the predicted weather changes they may be regarded as mere moonshine a number of predictions founded on the motions of the sun and moon have found a place during many months past in the columns of a contemporary but there has been no greater agreement between these predictions and the weather actually experienced than any one could trace between old moore's weather prophecies and recorded weather changes in other words there have been certain accordances which would be very remarkable indeed if they did not happen to be associated with as many equally remarkable disaccordances random predictions would be quite as satisfactory a very amusing misprint has found its way into many newspapers in connection with the coming tide it is interesting as serving to show how little is really known by the general public about some of the simplest scientific matters the original statement announced that the sun would not be in perihelion by so many seconds of semi diameter in itself a very incorrect mode of expression still it was clear that what was meant was that the earth would be so far from the place of nearest approach to the sun that the latter would not look as large as possibly can look by so many seconds of semi diameter in many papers however we read that the sun will not be in perihelion by so many seconds of mean chronometer who first devised this marvelous reading is unknown from the daily news for september twenty seventh eighteen sixty nine end of section eleven Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 12 of Light Science for Leisure Hours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen. Vancouver, B.C. Light Science for Leisure Hours by Richard A. Proctor Deep Sea Dredgings Men have ever been strangely charmed by the unknown and the seemingly inaccessible. The astronomer exhibits the influence of this charm as he constructs larger and larger telescopes, that he may penetrate more and more deeply beyond the veil which conceals the greater part of the universe from the unaided eye 
the geologists seeking to piece together the fragmentary records of the past which the earth's surface presents to him is equally influenced by the charm of mystery and difficulty and the microscopist who tries to force from nature the secret of the infinitely little is led on by the same strange desire to discover just those matters which nature has been most careful to conceal from us the energy with which in recent times men have sought to master the problem of deep sea sounding and deep sea dredging is perhaps one of the most striking instances ever afforded of the charm which the unknown possesses for mankind not long ago one of the most eminent geographers of the sea spoke regretfully about the small knowledge men have obtained of the depths of ocean greater difficulties he remarked that any presented by the problem of deep sea research have been overcome in other branches of physical inquiry astronomers have measured the volumes and weighted the masses of the most distant planets and increased thereby the stock of human knowledge it is credible to the age that the depths of the sea should remain in the category of unsolved problems that is ooze and bottom should be a sealed volume rich with ancient and eloquent legends and suggestive of many an instructive lesson that might be useful and profitable to man since that time however deep sea dredging has gradually become more and more thoroughly understood and mastered when the telegraphic cable which had lain so many months at the bottom of the atlantic was hauled on board the great eastern from enormous depths men were surprised and almost startled by the narrative the appearance of the ooze covered cable as it was slowly raised towards the surface and the strange thrill when it ran through those who saw it and remembered through what mysterious depths it had twice passed its breaking away almost from the very hands of those who sought to draw it on board and the successful renewal of the attempt to recover the cable all these things were heard of as one listens to a half incredible tale yet when that work was accomplished deep sea dredging had already been some time a science and many things had been achieved by its professors when presented in reality greater practical difficulties than the recovery of the atlantic cable recently however deep sea researches have been carried on with results which are even more sensational so to speak than the grappling feat which so surprised us seas so deep that many of the loftiest summits of the alps might be completely buried beneath them have been explored dredges weighing with their load of mud nearly half a ton have been hauled up without a hitch from depths of some fourteen thousand feet but not merely has comparatively rough work of this sort been achieved but by a variety of ingenious controvices men of science have been able to measure the temperature of sea at depths where the pressure is so enormous as to be equivalent to a weight of more than 430 tons on every square foot of surface the results of these researches are even more remarkable and surprising however than the means by which they have been obtained sir charles lyell has fairly spoken of them so astonishing that they have to the geologist almost a revolutionary character let us consider a few of them no light can be supposed to penetrate to the enormous depth just spoken of therefore how certainly we must conclude that there can be no life there if instead of dealing with the habit ability of planets where well in his plurality of worlds had been considering the question whether at depths of two or three miles living creatures could subexist how convincingly would he have proved the absurdity of such a supposition intense cold perfect darkness and a persistent pressure of two or three tons to the square inch 
Such, he might have argued, are the conditions under which life exists, if at all, in those dismal depths. And even if he had been disposed to concede the bare possibility that life of some sort may be found there, then certainly he would have urged some new sense must replace sight. The creatures in these depths can assuredly have no eyes, or only rudimentary ones. But the recent deep-sea dredgings have proved that not only does life exist in the very deepest parts of the Atlantic, but that the beings which live and move and have their being beneath three miles of water have eyes which the ablest naturalists pronounce to be perfectly developed. Light, then, of some sort must exist in those abysms, though whether the home of the deep-sea animals to be phosphorescent, as Sir Charles Lyell suggests, or whether light reaches these creatures in some other way, we have no present means of determining. If there is one theory which geologists have thought more justly founded than all others, it is the view that the various strata of the earth were formed at different times. A chalk district, for example, lying side by side with a sandstone district, has been referred to a totally different era. Whether the chalk was formed first, or whether the sandstone existed before the minute races came into being which formed the Cretaceous stratum, might be a question. But no doubt existed in the minds of geologists that each formation belonged to a distinct period. Now, however, Dr. Carpenter and Professor Thompson may fairly say, we have changed all this. It has been found that at points of the sea bottom only eight or ten miles apart, there may be in progress the formation of a Cretaceous deposit of a sandstone region, each with its own proper fauna. Wherever similar conditions are found upon the dry land of the present day, remarks Dr. Carpenter, it has been supposed that the formation of chalk and the formation of sandstone must have been separated from each other by long periods, and the discovery that they may actually coexist upon adjacent surfaces has done no less than strike at the very root of the customary assumptions with regards to geological time. Even more interesting, perhaps, to many are the results which have been obtained respecting the varying temperatures of deep sea regions. The peculiarity just considered is indeed a consequence of such variations, but the fact itself is at least as interesting as the consequences which flow from it. It throws light on the long-standing controversy respecting the oceanic circulation. It has been found that the depths of the equatorial and tropical seas are colder than those of the North Atlantic. In the tropics, the deep sea temperature is considerably below the freezing point of fresh water. In the deepest part of the Bay of Biscay, the temperature is several degrees above the freezing point. Thus one learns that the greater part of the water which lies deep below the surface of the equatorial and tropical seas comes from the Antarctic regions, though undoubtedly there are certain relatively narrow currents which carry the waters of the Arctic seas to the tropics. The great point to notice is that water under the equatorial seas must really have traveled from the polar regions. A cold of 30 degrees can be explained in no other way. We see at once, therefore, the explanation of those westerly equatorial currents which have been so long a subject of contest. Sir John Herschel failed to prove that they are due to the trade winds, but Maury failed equally to prove that they are due to the great warmth and consequent buoyancy of the equatorial waters. In fact, while Maury showed very convincingly that the great system of oceanic circulation is carried on despite the winds, 
Herschel proved in an equally convincing manner that the overflow conceived by Maury should result in an easterly instead of a westerly current. Recently the theory was put forward that the continual process of evaporation going on in the equatorial regions leads to an indraft of cold water in bottom currents from the polar seas. Such currents coming towards the equator, that is, traveling from the latitudes where the Earth's eastward motion is less to latitudes, where that motion is greater, would lag behind, that is, would have a westerly motion. It seems now placed beyond a doubt that this is the true explanation of the equatorial ocean currents. Such are few, and but a few, among the many interesting results which have followed from the recent researches of Dr. Carpenter and Professor Thompson into the hitherto little-known depths of the Great Sea. From the Spectator, December 4th, 1869. End of section 12. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 13 of Light Science for Leisure Hours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Light Science for Leisure Hours by Richard A. Proctor. The Tunnel Through Mont Senes. Men flash their messages across mighty continents and beneath the bosom of the wide Atlantic. They weigh the distant planets and analyze sun and stars. They span Niagara with a railway bridge and pierce the Alps with a railway tunnel. Yet the poet of the age in which all these things are done or doing sings, We men are a punny race. And certainly the great works which belong to a man as a race can no more be held to evidence the importance of the individual man than the vast coral reefs and atolls of the Pacific can be held to evidence the working power of the individual coral polyp. But if man standing alone is weak, man working according to the law assigned to his race from the beginning, that is, in fellowship with his kind, is verily a being of power. Perhaps no work ever undertaken by man strikes one as more daring than the attempt to pierce the Alps with a tunnel. Nature seems to have upreared these mighty barriers as if with the design of showing man how weak he is in her presence. Even the armies of Hannibal and Napoleon seemed all but powerless in the face of these vast natural fastnesses, compelled to creep slowly and cautiously along the difficult and narrow ways which alone were open to them, decimated by the chilling blasts which swept the face of the rugged mountain range, and dreading at every moment the pitless swoop of the avalanche, the French and Carnathian troops exhibited little of the pomp and dignity which we are apt to associate with the operation of warlike armies. Had the denizen of some other planet been able to watch their progress, he might indeed have said, These men are a punny race. In this only, that they succeeded, did the troops of Hannibal and Napoleon assert the dignity of the human race. Grand as was the aspect of nature, and mean as was that of men during the progress of the contest, it was nature that was conquered, man that overcame. And now man has entered on a new conflict with nature in the gloomy fastness of the Alps. The barrier which he had scaled of old has now undertaken to pierce and the W, w w bold and daring as it seemed is three parts finished see date of article the mont 
tunnel was sanctioned by the Sardinian government in 1857, and arrangements were made for fixing the perforating machinery in the years 1858 and 1859, but the work was not actually commenced until November 1860. The tunnel, which will be fully seven and a half miles in length, was to be completed in 25 years. The entrance to the tunnel on the side of France is near the little village of Forno and lies 3,946 feet above the level of the sea. The entrance on the side of Italy is in a deep valley at Bardenoche and lies 4,380 feet above the sea level. Thus there is a difference of level of 434 feet but the tunnel will actually rise 445 feet above the level of the French end, attaining this height at a distance of about four miles from the extremity. In the remaining three and three-quarter miles, there will be a fall of only ten feet, so that this part of the line will be practically level. The rocks through which the excavations have been made have been, for the most part, very difficult to work. Those who imagine that the great mass of our mountain ranges consist of such granite as is made use of in our buildings and is uniform in texture and hardness greatly underrate the difficulties with which the engineers of this gigantic work have to contend. A large part of the rock consists of a crystallized calcareous sheets, much broken and contorted, and through this rock run in every direction large masses of pure quartz. It will be conceived how difficult the work has been of piercing through so diversified a substance as this. The perforating machines are calculated to work best when the resistance is uniform, and it has often happened that the unequal resistance offered to the perforators has resulted in injury to the chisels. But before the work of perforating began, enormous difficulties had to be contended with. It will be understood that, in a tunnel of such vast length, it was absolutely necessary that the perforating processes carried on from the two ends should be directed with the most perfect accuracy. It has often happened in short tunnels that a want of perfect coincidence has existed between the two halves of the work, and the tunnelers from one end have sometimes altogether have failed to meet from the other. In a short tunnel, this want of coincidence is not very important because the two interior ends of the tunnelings cannot in any case be far removed from each other. But in the case of the Mont Cenis tunnel, any inaccuracy in the direction of the two tunnelings would have been fatal to the success of the work, since when the two ought to meet, it might be found that they were laterally separated by two or three hundred yards. Hence it was necessary before the work began to survey the intermediate country, so to ascertain with the most perfect accuracy the bearings of one end of the tunnel from the other. It was necessary, says the narrative of these initial laborers, to prepare accurate plans and sections for the determination of the levels, to fix the axis of the tunnel, and to set it out on the mountain top, to erect observatories and guiding signals, solid, substantial, and true. When we remember the nature of the passes over this senis, we can conceive the difficulty of setting out a line this sort over the alpine range. The necessity of continually climbing over rocks, ravines, and precipices in passing from station to station involved difficulties which, great as they were, were as nothing when compared with the difficulties resulting from the bitter weather experienced on these rugged mountain heights. The tempests which sweep the alpine passes, the ever-recurring storms of rain, sleet, and driving snow, are trying to the ordinary traveler. 
it will be understood therefore how terribly they must have interfered with the delicate processes involved in surveying it often happened that for days together no work of any sort could be done owing to the impossibility of using levels and theodites when exposed to the stormy weather and bitter cold of these lofty passes at length however the work was completed and that with success that the greatest deviation from exactitude was less than a single foot for the whole length of seven and a half miles equally remarkable and extensive were the labors connected with the preparatory works new and solid roads bridges canals magazines workshops forges furnaces and machinery had to be constructed residence had to be built for the men and offices for the engineers in fact at each extremity of the tunnel a complete establishment had to be formed those who have traversed mount seni since the works began have been perplexed by the strange appearance and character of the machinery and establishments to be seen at modane and forno the mass of pipes and tubes tanks reservoirs and machinery which would be marvelous anywhere has a still stranger look in a wild and rugged alpine pass from the daily news 1869 end of section 13 recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc section number 14 of light science for leisure hours this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver bc light science for leisure hours by richard a proctor tornadoes the inhabitants of earth are subjected to agencies which beneficial doubtless in the long run perhaps necessary to the very existence of terrestrial races appear at first sight energetically destructive such are in order of destructiveness the hurricane the earthquake the volcano and the thunderstorm when we read of earthquakes such as those which overthrew Lisbon, Callao, and Riobamba, and learn that 100,000 persons fell victim in the great Sicilian earthquake in 1693, and probably 300,000 in the tooth earthquakes which assailed Antonic in the years 526 and 612, we are disposed to assign at once to this devastating phenomenon the foremost place among the agents of destruction. But this judgment must be reversed when we consider that earthquakes, though so fearfully and suddenly destructive both to life and property, yet occur but seldom compared with windstorms, while the effects of a real hurricane are scarcely less destructive than those of the sharpest shocks of earthquakes. After ordinary storms, long miles of the sea coast are strewn with the wrecks of many once gallant ships and with the bodies of their hapless crews. In the spring of 1866, there might be seen a single view from the heights near Plymouth, 22 shipwrecked vessels and this after a storm which, though severe, but was trifling compared with the hurricanes which swept over the torrid zones, and thence scarcely diminished in force, as far north sometimes as their own latitudes. It was in such a hurricane that the Royal Charter was wrecked, and hundreds of stout ships with her, in the great hurricane of 1780 which commenced at barbados and swept across the whole breadth of the north atlantic fifty sails were driven ashore at the bermudas two line of battleships went down at sea 
and upwards of twenty thousand persons lost their lives on the land so tremendous was the force of this hurricane captain murray tells us that the bark was blown from trees and the fruits of the earth destroyed the very bottom and depths of the sea were uprooted forts and castles were washed away and their great guns carried in the air like chaff houses were razed ships wrecked and the bodies of men and beasts lifted up in the air and dashed to pieces in the storm an account however which though doubtless faithfully rendered by maury from the authorities he consulted must perhaps be accepted come grano and especially with reference to the great guns carried in air like chaff if so it blew great guns indeed in the gale of august seventeen eighty two all trophies of lord rodney's victory except the ardent were destroyed two british ships of the line foundered at sea numbers of merchantmen under admiral graves convoy were wrecked and at sea alone three thousand lives were lost but quite recently a storm far more destructive than these swept over the bay of bengal most of my readers doubtless remember the great gale of october eighteen sixty four in which all the ships in harbour at calcutta were swept from their anchorage and driven one upon another in inextricable confusion fearful as was the loss of life and property in calcutta harbor the destruction on land was greater a vast wave swept for miles over the surrounding country embankments were destroyed and whole villages with their inhabitants were swept away fifty thousand souls it is believed perished in the fearful hurricane the gale which has just ravaged the gulf of mexico adds another to the long list of disastrous hurricanes as i write the effects produced by this tornado are beginning to be made known already its destructiveness has become but too certainly evidenced the laws which appear to regulate the generation and the progress of cyclonic storms are well worthy of careful study the regions chiefly infested by hurricanes are the west indies the southern parts of the indian ocean the bay of bengal and the china seas each region has its special hurricane season in the west indies cyclones occur principally in august and september when the southeast monsoons are at their height at the same season the african southwesterly monsoons are blowing accordingly there are two sets of winds both blowing heavily and steadily from the atlantic disturbing the atmospheric equilibrium and thus in all probability generating the great west indian hurricanes the storms thus arriving show their force first at a distance of about six or seven hundred miles from the equator and far to the east of the region in which they attain their greatest fury they sweep with a northwesterly course to the gulf of mexico pass thence northwards and so to the northeast sweeping in a wide curve resembling the letter u placed thus c around the west indian seas and thence traveling across the atlantic generally expending their fury before they reach the shores of western europe this course is the storm track or storm sea as i shall call it of the behavior of the winds as they traverse this track i shall have to speak when i can come to consider the peculiarity from which these storms derive their names of cyclones and tornadoes the hurricanes of the indian ocean occur at the changing of the monsoons during the interregnum writes maury the fiends of the storm hold their terrific sway be calmed often for a day or two seamen hear moaning sounds in the air forewarning them of the coming storm then suddenly 
the winds break loose from the forces which have for a while controlled them and seem to rage with a fury that would break up the fountains of the deep in the north indian seas hurricanes rage at the same season as in the west indies in the china seas occur these fearful gales known among sailors as typhoons or white squalls these take place at the changing of the monsoons generated like the west indian hurricanes at a distance of some ten or twelve degrees from the equator typhoons sweep in a curve similar to that followed by the atlantic storms around the east indian archipelago and the shores of china to the japanese islands there occur land storms also of a cyclonic character in the valley of the mississippi i have often observed the pass of such storms says maury through the forests of the mississippi there the track of these tornadoes is called a wind road because they make an avenue through the wood straight along and as clear of trees as if the old denizens of the forest had been cleared with an axe i have seen trees three or four feet in diameter torn up by the roots and the top with its limbs lying next the hole whence the root came another writer who was an eye-witness to the progress of one of these american landstorms thus speaks of its destructive effects i saw to my great astonishment that the noblest trees of the forest were falling into pieces a mass of branches twigs foliage and dust moved through the air whirling onward like a cloud of feathers and passing disclosed a wide space filled with broken trees naked stumps and heaps of shapeless ruins which marked the path of the tempest if it appeared on a careful comparison of observations made in different places that these winds swept directly along those tracks which they appear to follow a comparatively simple problem would be presented to the meteorologist but this is not found to be the case at one part of a hurricane's course the storm appears to be traveling with fearful fury along the true storm sea at another less furiously directed across the storm track at another but yet diminished force through still fiercely in a direction exactly opposite to that of the storm track all these motions appear to be fairly accounted for by the theory that the true path of the storm is a spiral or rather that while the center of the disturbance continually travels onwards in a widely extended curve the storm wind sweeps continually around the center of disturbance as a whirlpool around its vortex and here a remarkable circumstance attracts our notice the consideration of which points to the mode in which cyclones may be conceived to be generated it is found by a careful study of different observations made up the same storm that cyclones in the northern hemisphere invariably sweep round the onward travelling vortex of disturbance in one direction and the southern cyclones in the contrary direction if we place a watch face upwards upon one of the northern cyclones regions in a mechator's chart then the motion of the hands is contrary to the direction in which the cyclone whirls when the watch is shifted to a southern cyclone region the motion of the hands is in the same direction as the cyclone motion this peculiarity is converted into the following rule of thumb for sailors who encounter a cyclone and seek to escape from the region of fiercest storm facing the wind the center or vortex of the storm lies to the right in the northern to the left in the southern hemisphere safety lies in flying from the center in every case save one that is when the sailor lies in the direct track of the advancing vortex 
in this case to fly from the center would be to keep in the storm track the proper course for the sailor when thus situated is to steer for the calmer side of the storm track this is always the outside of the sea as will appear from a moment's consideration of the spiral curve traced out by a cyclone thus if the seamen scud before the wind in all other cases a dangerous expedient in a cyclone he will probably escape unscathed there is however this danger that the storm trap may extend to or even slightly overlap the land in which case scudding before the gale would bring the ship upon a lee shore and in this way many gallant ships have doubtless suffered wreck the danger of the sailor is obviously greater however when he is overtaken by the storm of the inner side of the storm sea here he has to encounter the double force of the cyclonic whirl and of the advancing storm system instead of the difference of the two motions as on the outer side of the storm track his chance of escape will depend on his distance from the central path of the cyclone if near to this it is equally dangerous for him to attempt to scud to the safer side of the track or to beat against the wind by the shorter course which would lead him out of the storm sea on its inner side it has been shown by colonel sir w reed that this is the quarter in which vessels have been most frequently lost but even the danger of this most dangerous quarter admits of degrees it is greatest when the storm is sweeping round the most curved part of its track which happens in about latitude twenty five or thirty degrees in this case a ship may pass twice through the vortex of the storm here hurricanes have worked their most destructive effects and hence it is that sailors dread most of all that part of the atlantic near florida and the bahamas and the region of the indian ocean which lies south of bourbon and mauritius to show how important it is that captains should understand the theory of cyclones in both hemispheres we shall here relate the manner in which captain j v hall escaped from a typhoon of the china seas about noon when three days out from mako captain hall saw a most wild and uncommon looking halo round the sun on the afternoon of the next day the barometer had commenced to fall rapidly and though as yet the weather was fine orders were at once given to prepare for a heavy gale towards evening a bank of cloud was seen in the southeast but when night closed the weather was still calm and the water smooth though the sky looked wild and a scud was coming on from the northeast i was much interested says captain hall in watching for the commencement of the gale which i now felt was sure coming the bank to the southeast was the meteor cyclone approaching us the northeast scud the outer northwest portion of it and when at night a strong gale came on about north or north northwest i felt certain we were on its western and southwestern verge it rapidly increased in violence but i was pleased to see the wind veering to the northwest as it convinced me that I had put the ship on the right track, namely, on the starboard tack, standing, of course, to the southwest. From 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. it blew with great violence, but the ship, being well prepared, rode comparatively easy. The barometer was now very low, the center of the storm passing to the northward of us, to which we might have been very near had we in the first place put the ship on the larboard tack but the most remarkable point of captain hall's account remains to be mentioned 
he had gone out of his course to avoid the storm but when the wind fell to a moderate gale he thought it a pity to lie so far from his proper course and made sail to the northwest in less than two hours the barometer again began to fall and the storm to rage in heavy gusts he bore again to the southeast and the weather rapidly improved there can be little doubt that but for captain hull's knowledge of the law of cyclones his ship and crew would have been placed in serious jeopardy since in the heart of a chinese typhoon a ship has been known to be thrown on her beam ends when not showing a yard of canvas if we consider the regions in which cyclones appear the paths they follow and the direction in which they whirl we shall be able to form an opinion as their origin in the open pacific ocean as its name indeed applies storms are uncommon they are infrequent also in the south atlantic and south indian ocean around cape horn and the cape of good hope heavy storms prevail but they are not cyclonic nor are they equal in fury and frequency maury tells us to the true tornado along the equator and for several degrees on either side of it cyclones are also unknown if we turn to a map in which ocean currents are laid down we shall see that in every cyclonic region there is a strong marked current and that each current follows closely the track which i have denominated the storm sea in the north atlantic we have the great gulf stream which sweeps from equatorial regions into the gulf of mexico and thence across the atlantic to the shores of western europe in the south indian ocean there is the south equatorial current which sweeps past mauritius and bourbon and thence returns towards the east in the chinese sea there is the north equatorial current which sweeps round the east indian archipelago and then merges into the japanese current there is also the current in the bay of bengal flowing through the region in which as we have seen cyclones are commonly met with there are other sea currents besides these which yet breed no cyclones but i may notice two peculiarities in the currents i have named they all flow from equatorial to temperate regions and secondly they are all horseshoe currents so far as i am aware there is but one other current which presents these peculiarities namely the great australian current between new zealand and the eastern shores of australia i have not yet met with any record of cyclones occurring over the australian current but heavy storms are known to prevail in that region and i believe that when these storms have been studied as closely as the storms in better known regions they will be found to present the true cyclonic character now if we inquire why an ocean current traveling from the equator should be a storm breeder we shall find a ready answer such a current carrying the warmth of intertropical regions to the temperate zones produces in the first place by the mere difference of temperature important atmospheric disturbances the difference is so great that franklin suggested the use of the thermometer in the north atlantic ocean as a ready means of determining the longitude since the position of the gulf stream at any given season is almost constant but the warmth of the stream itself is not the only cause of atmospheric disturbance over the warm water vapor is continually rising and as it rises is continually condensed like the steam from a locomotive by the colder air round an observer on the moon says captain maury would on a winter's day be able to trace out by the mist in the air 
the path of the Gulf Stream through the sea. But what must happen when the vapor is condensed? We know that to turn water into vapor is a process requiring, that is, using up, a large amount of heat, and conversely the return of vapor to the state of water sets free an equivalent quantity of heat. The amount of heat thus set free over the Gulf Stream is thousands of times greater than which would be generated by the whole coal supply annually raised in Great Britain. Here then we have an efficient cause for the wildest hurricanes, for along the whole of the Gulf Stream, from Benway to the Grand Banks, there is a channel of heated, that is, rarefied air. Into this channel the denser atmosphere on both sides is continually pouring with greater or less strength. When a storm begins in the Atlantic, it always makes for this channel, and, reaching it, turns and follows in its course, sometimes entirely across the Atlantic. The southern points of America and Africa have won for themselves, says Morey, the name of the stormy capes, but there is not a storm find in the wide ocean can outtop that which rages along the Atlantic coasts of North America. The China Seas and the North Pacific may vie in the fury of their gales, this part of the Atlantic, but Cape Horn and the Cape of Good Hope cannot equal them, certainly in frequency, nor do I believe in fury. We read of a West Indian storm so violent that it forced the Gulf Stream back to its sources and piled up the waters to a height of thirty feet in the Gulf of Mexico. The ship, Ledbury Snow, attempted to ride out the storm. When it abated, she found herself high up on the dry land and discovered that she had let go her anchor among the treetops on Elliot's Key. But like a reasoning, we can account for the cyclonic storms prevailing in the North Pacific Ocean. Nor do the tornadoes which rage in parts of the United States present any serious difficulty. The region along which these storms travel is the valley of the Great Mississippi. This river at certain seasons is considerably warmer than the surrounding lands. From its surface, also, aqueous vapor is continually being raised. When the surrounding air is colder, this vapor is presently condensed, generating in the change a vast amount of heat. We have thus a channel of rarefied air over the Mississippi Valley, and this channel becomes a storm track, like the corresponding channels over the warm ocean currents. The extreme violence of land storms is probably due to the narrowness of the tract within which they are compelled to travel, for it has been noticed that the fury of a sea cyclone increases as the range of the world diminished and vice versa. There seems, however, no special reason why cyclones should follow the storm sea in one direction rather than in the other. We must, to understand this, recall the fact that under the torrid zones the conditions necessary for the generation of storms prevail far more intensely than in temperate regions. Thus the probability is far greater that cyclones should be generated at the tropical than at the temperate end of the storm sea. Still, it is worthy of notice that the landlocked North Pacific Ocean, true typhoons have been noticed to follow the storm track in a direction contrary to that commonly noticed. The direction in which a true tornado whirls is invariably that I have mentioned. The explanation of this peculiarity would occupy more space than I can here afford. Those readers who may wish to understand the origin of the law of cyclonic rotation 
should study Herschel's interesting work on meteorology. The suddenness with which a true tornado works destruction was strikingly exemplified in the wreck of the steamship San Francisco. She was assailed by an extra-tropical tornado when about 300 miles from Sandy Hook on December 24, 1853. In a few moments she was a complete wreck. The wide range of a tornado's destructiveness is shown by this, that Colonel Reed tells us of one along whose track no less than 110 ships were wrecked, crippled, or dismasted from Temple Bar, December 1867. End of section 14. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Section number 15 of Light Science for Leisure Hours. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Light Science for Leisure Hours by Richard A. Proctor, Vesuvius. The numerous and violent eruptions from Mount Vesuvius during the last two centuries seem to afford an answer to those who think there are traces of a gradually diminishing activity in the Earth's internal forces. That such a diminution is taking place we may admit, but that its rate of progress is perceptible. That we can point to a time within the historical epoch nay even within the limits of geological evidence at which the earth's internal forces were certainly more active than they are in the present time may i think be denied absolutely when the science of geology was but young and its professors sought to compress within a few years at the outside a series of events which we know now must have occupied many centuries there was room indeed for the supposition that modern volcanic eruptions as compared with ancient outbursts are but as the efforts of children compared with the work of giants and accordingly we find a distinguished french geologist writing even so late as eighteen twenty nine that in ancient times two les phénomènes géologiques se passant dans les dimensions se tuple de sel qu'il présente aujourd'hui but now we have such certain evidence of the enormous length of the intervals within which volcanic regions assume their present appearance we have such satisfactory means of determining which of the events occurring within these intervals were or were not contemporary, that we are safe from the error of assuming that nature, at a single effort, fashioned widely extended districts, just as we now see them, and accordingly we have the evidence of the distinguished geologist, Sir Charles Lyell, that there is no volcanic mass of ancient date distinctly referable to a single eruption which can even rival in volume the matter poured out from Skaptar Jokul in 1783. In the volcanic region of which Sesuvius or Soma is the principal vent, we have remarkable instance of the deceptive nature of the state of rest into which some of the principal volcanoes frequently fall for many centuries together, for how many centuries before the Christian era Vesuvius had been at rest is not known, but this is certain, that from the landing of the first Greek colony in southern Italy, Vesuvius gave no signs of internal activity. It was recognized by Strabo as a volcanic mountain, but Pliny did not include it in the list of active volcanoes. 
in those days the mountain presented a very different appearance from that which it now exhibits in place of the two peaks now seen there was a single somewhat flattish summit on which a slight depression marked the place of an ancient crater the fertile slopes of the mountain were covered with well-cultivated fields and the thriving cities herculaneum pompeii and stabi stood near the base of the sleeping mountain so little did any thought of danger suggest itself in those times that the bands of slaves murderers and pirates which flocked to the standards of spartacus found a refuge to the number of many thousands within the very crater itself but though vesuvius was at rest the region of which vesuvius is the main vent was far from being so the island of pithecusa the modern ischia was shaken by frequent and terrible convulsions it is even related that prochetta the modern proceda was rent from pithecusa in the course of a tremendous upheaval though pliny derives the name prochetta or poured forth from the supposed fact of this island having been poured forth from an eruption from ischia far more probably prochita was formed independently by submarine eruptions as the volcanic islands near santorini have been produced in more recent times so fierce were the eruptions from pithecusa that several greek colonies which attempted to settle on this island were compelled to leave it about three hundred and eighty years before the christian era colonists under king hero of syracuse who had built a fortress on pithecusa were driven away by an eruption nor were eruptions the sole cause of danger poisonous vapors such as are emitted by volcanic craters after eruption appear to have exhaled at times from extensive tracts on pithecusa and thus to have rendered the island uninhabitable still nearer to vesuvius lay the celebrated lake avernus the name avernus is said to be a corruption of the greek word ernos signifying without birds the poisonous exultations from the waters of the lake destroying all birds which attempted to fly over its surface doubt has been thrown on the destructive properties assigned by the ancients to the vapors ascending from avernus the lake is now a healthy and agreeable neighborhood frequented says humboldt by many kinds of birds which suffer no injury whatever even when they skim the very surface of the water yet there can be little doubt that avernus hides the outlet of an extinct volcano and long after this volcano had become inactive the lake which concealed its site may have deserved the appellation of atri jana detris emitting perhaps gases as destructive of animal life as those suffocating vapors given out by lake quilota in quito in 1797 by which whole herds of cattle were killed on its shores or as those deleterious emanations which annihilated all the cattle in the island of lancerote one of the canaries in 1730 while ischia was in full activity not only was vesuvius quiescent but even etna seemed to be gradually expiring so that seneca ranks this volcano among the number of nearly extinguished craters at a later epoch alien asserted that the mountain itself was sinking so that seamen lost sight of the summit at a less distance across the seas than of old yet within the last two hundred years there have been eruptions from etna rivaling if not surpassing in intensity the convulsions recorded by ancient historians i shall not here attempt to show that vesuvius and etna 
belong to the same volcanic system, though there is reason not only for supposing this to be the case, but for the belief that all the subterranean regions whose effects have been shown from time to time over the district extending from the Canaries and Azores across the whole of the Mediterranean and into Syria itself belong to but one great center of internal action. But it is quite certain that Ischia and Vesuvius are outlets from a single source. While Vesuvius was dormant, resigning for a while its pretensions to be the principal vent of the great Napoleon volcanic system, Ischia, we have seen, was rent by frequent convulsions. But the time was approaching when Vesuvius was to resume its natural functions, and with all the more energy that they had been for a while suspended. In the year 63, after Christ, there occurred a violent convulsion of the earth around Vesuvius, during which much injury was done to neighboring cities, and many lives were lost. From this period shocks of earthquake were felt from time to time for sixteen years. These grew gradually more and more violent, until it began to be evident that the volcanic fires were about to return to their main vent. The obstruction which had so long impeded the exit of the confined matter was not, however, readily removed, and it was only in August in the year 79, after numerous and violent internal throes, that the superincumbent mass was at length hurled forth. Rocks and cinders, lava, sand, and scoriae were propelled from the crater and spread many miles on every side of Vesuvius. We have an interesting account of the great eruption which followed in a letter from the younger Pliny to the younger Tacitus. The latter had asked for an account of the death of the elder Pliny, who lost his life in his eagerness to obtain a near view of the dreadful phenomenon. He was at that time, says his nephew, with the fleet under the command at Misenum. On August 24th, about one in the afternoon, my mother desired him to observe a cloud of very extraordinary size and shape. He had just returned from taking the benefit of the sun, and after bathing himself in cold water and taking a slight repast, had retired to his study. He arose at once and went out upon a height whence he might more distinctly view this strange phenomenon. It was not at this distance discernible from what mountain the cloud issued, but it was found afterwards that it came from Vesuvius. I cannot give a more exact description of its figure than by comparing it to that of a pine tree, for it shot up to a great height in the form of a trunk, which extended itself at the top into a sort of branches, occasioned, I suppose, either by a sudden gust of air which impelled it, whose force decreased as it advanced upwards, or else the cloud itself, being pressed back by its own weight, expanded in the manner. The cloud appeared sometimes bright, at others dark and spotted, as it was more or less impregnated with earth and cinders. These extraordinary appearances attracted the curiosity of the elder Pliny. He ordered a small vessel to be prepared, and started to seek a nearer view of the burning mountain. His nephew declined to accompany him, being engaged with his studies. As Pliny left the house, he received a note from a lady whose house, being at the foot of Vesuvius, was in imminent danger of destruction. He set out, accordingly, with the design of rendering her assistance, and also of assisting others, for the villas stood extremely thick upon that lovely coast. He ordered the galleys to be put to sea, and steered directly to the point of danger, so cool in the midst of the turmoil around, 
as to be able to make and dictate observations upon the motions and figures of that dreadful scene. As he approached Vesuvius, cinders, pumice stones, and black fragments of burning rock fell on and around the ships. They were in danger, too, of running aground, owing to the sudden retreat of the sea. Vast fragments, also, rolled down from the mountain and obstructed all the shore. The pilot advising retreat, Pliny made the noble answer, Fortune befriends the brave, and bade him press onwards to Sabai. Here he found his friend Pompanianus in great consternation, already prepared for embarking and waiting only for a change in the wind. Exhorting Pompatanius to be of good courage, Pliny quietly ordered baths to be prepared, and having bathed, sat down to supper with great cheerfulness, or at least, which is equally heroic, with all the appearance of it. Assuring his friend that the flames which appeared in several places were merely burning villages, Pliny presently retired to rest, and being pretty fat, says his nephew, and breathing hard, those who attended without actually heard him snore. But it became necessary to awaken him, for the court which led to his room was now almost filled with stones and ashes. He got up and joined the rest of the company, who were consulting on the propriety of leaving the house now shaken from side to side by frequent concussions. They decided on seeking the fields for safety, and fastening pillows on their heads to protect them from falling stones. They advanced in the midst of an obscurity greater than that of the darkest night, though beyond the limits of the great cloud it was already broad day. When they reached the shore they found the waves running too high to suffer them safely to venture to put out to sea. Pliny, having drunk a draught or two of cold water, lay down on a cloth that was spread out for him, but at this moment the flames and sulphurous vapours dispersed the rest of the company, and obliged him to rise. Assisted by two of his servants, he got up upon his feet, but instantly fell down, dead, suffocated, I suppose, says his nephew, by some gross and noxious vapour, for he always had weak lungs, and suffered from a difficulty of breathing. His body was not found until the third day after his death, when for the first time it was light enough to search for him. He was found as he had fallen and looking more like a man asleep than dead. But even at Misenum there was danger. Though Vesuvius is distant no less than fourteen miles, the earth was shaken with repeated and violent shocks. Insomuch, says the younger Pliny, that they threatened our complete destruction. When morning came, the light was faint and glimmering, the buildings around seemed tottering to their fall, and standing on open ground, the chariots which Pliny had ordered were so agitated backwards and forwards that it was impossible to keep them steady, even by supporting them with large stones. The sea was rolled back upon itself, and many marine animals were left dry upon the shore. On the side of Vesuvius a black and ominous cloud, bursting with sulphurous vapours, darted out long trains of fire, resembling flashes of lightning, but much larger. Presently the great cloud spread over Misenum and the island of Capri. Ashes fell around the fugitives. On every side nothing was to be heard but the shrieks of women and children, and the cries of men. Some were calling for their children, others for their parents, others for their husbands, and only distinguishing each other by the voices. One was lamenting his own fate, another that of his family. Some wished to die, that they might escape the dreadful fear of death. But the greater part imagined that the last and eternal night was come, which was to destroy the gods and the world together. 
At length a light appeared, which was not, however, the day, but the forerunner of an outburst of flames. These presently disappeared, and again a thick darkness spread over the scene. Ashes fell heavily upon the fugitives, so that they were in danger of being crushed and buried in the thick layer rapidly covering the whole country. Many hours passed before the dreadful darkness began slowly to be dissipated, when at length day returned and the sun was seen faintly shining through the overhanging canopy of ashes. Every object seemed changed, being covered over with white ashes as with a deep snow. It is most remarkable that Pliny makes no mention in his letter of the destruction of the two populous and important cities, Pompeii and Herculaneum. We have seen that at Sabe, a shower of ashes fell so heavily that several days before the end of the eruption, the court leading to the elder Pliny's room was beginning to be filled up, and when the eruption ceased, Sabe was completely overwhelmed. Far more sudden, however, was the destruction of Pompeii and Herculaneum. It would seem that the two cities were first shaken violently by the throes of the disturbed mountain. The signs of such a catastrophe have been very commonly assigned to the earthquake which happened in 63, but it seems far more likely that most of them belong to the days immediately preceding the great outburst in 79. In Pompeii, says Sir Charles Lyell, both public and private buildings bear testimony to the catastrophe. The walls are rent, and in many places traversed by fissures still open. It is probable that the inhabitants were driven by these anticipatory throes to fly from the doomed towns. For though Dion Cassius relates that two entire cities, Herculaneum and Pompeii, were buried under showers of ashes, while all the people were sitting in the theatre, yet the examinations of the two cities enables us to prove, says Sir Charles, that none of the people were destroyed in the theatre, and indeed that there were very few of the inhabitants who did not escape from both cities. Yet, he adds, some lives were lost, and there was ample foundation for the tale in all its most essential particulars. We may note here, in passing, that the account of the eruption given by Dion Cassius, who wrote a century and a half after the catastrophe, is sufficient to prove how terrible an impression had been made upon the inhabitants of Campania, from whose descendants he in all probability obtained the materials of his narrative. He writes that, during the eruption, a multitude of men of superhuman stature, resembling giants, appeared, sometimes on the mountain, and sometimes in the environs, that stones and smoke were thrown out, the sun was hidden, and then the giants seemed to rise again, when the sounds of trumpets were heard, with much other matter of a similar sort. In the great eruption of 79, Vesuvius poured forth lapilli, sand, cinders, and fragments of old lava, but no new lava flowed from the crater, nor does it appear that any lava stream was ejected during the six eruptions, which took place during the following ten centuries. In the year 1036, for the first time, Vesuvius was observed to pour forth a stream of molten lava. Thirteen years later, another eruption took place. Then ninety years passed without disturbance, and after that a long pause of a hundred and sixty-eight years. During this interval, however, the volcanic system, of which Vesuvius is the main but not the only vent, had been disturbed twice for it is related that in 1198 the Sulfata Lake crater was in eruption, and in 1302 Ischia, dormant for at least 1400 years, showed signs of new activity. 
for more than a year earthquakes had convulsed this island from time to time and at length the disturbed region was relieved by the outburst of a lava stream from a new vent on the south side of Ischia. The lava stream flowed right down to the sea a distance of two miles. For two months this dreadful outburst continued to rage. Many houses were destroyed, and although the inhabitants of Ischia were not completely expelled, as happened of old with Greek colonists, yet a partial emigration took place. The next eruption of Vesuvius occurred in 1306, and then three centuries and a quarter passed during which only one eruption, and that an unimportant one, in 1500, took place. It was remarked, says Sir Charles Lyell, that throughout this long interval of rest Etna was in a state of unusual activity, so as to lend countenance to the idea that the great Sicilian volcano may sometimes serve as a channel of discharge to elastic fluids and lava that would otherwise rise to the vents in Campania. Nor was the abnormal activity of Etna the only sign that the quintessence of Vesuvius was not to be looked upon as any evidence of declining energy in the volcanic system. In 1538, a new mountain was suddenly thrown up in the Fagrian fields, a district including within its bounds Pozzoli, Lake Avernus, and the Softera. The new mountain was thrown up near the shores of the Bay of Bae. It is 440 feet above the level of the bay, and its base is about a mile and a half in circumference. The depth of the crater is 421 feet, so that its bottom is only six yards above the level of the bay. The spot on which the mountain was thrown up was formerly occupied by the Lucrin Lake, but the outburst filled up the greater part of the lake, leaving only a small and shallow pool. The accounts which have reached us of the formation of this new mountain are not without interest. Falconi, who wrote in 1538, mentions that several earthquakes took place during the two years preceding the outburst, and above twenty shocks on the day and night before the eruption. The eruption began on September 29, 1538. It was a Sunday, about one o'clock in the night, when flames of fire were seen between the hot baths and Tripagola. In a short time the fire increased to such a degree that it burst open the earth in this place, and threw up a quantity of ashes and pumice stones mixed with water which covered the whole country. The next morning the poor inhabitants of Zoli quitted their habitations in terror, covered with the muddy and black shower which continued the whole day in that country, flying from death, but with death painted in their countenances, some with their children in their arms, some with sacks full of their goods, others leading an ass, loaded with their frightened family towards Naples. The sea had retired on the side of Bae, abandoning a considerable tract, and the shore appeared almost entirely dry, from the quantity of ashes and broken pumice stones thrown up by the eruption. Pietro Giacomo de Toledo gives us some account of the phenomena which preceded the eruption. The plain which lies between Lake Avernus, the Mount Barbaro, and the sea was raised a little, and many cracks were made in it, from some of which water issued. At the same time the sea immediately adjoining the plain dried up about two hundred paces, so that the fish were left on the sand, a prey to the inhabitants of Pozzoli. At last, on September twenty ninth, about two o'clock in the night, the earth opened near the lake and discovered a horrid mouth, from which were furiously vomited smoke, fire, stones, and mud, composed of ashes, making at the time of the 
opening a noise like the loudest thunder the stones which followed were by the flames converted to pumice and some of these were larger than an ox the stones went about as high as a crossbow will carry and then fell down sometimes on the edge and sometimes into the mouth itself the mud was the color of ashes and at very first liquid then by degrees less so and in such quantities that in less than twelve hours with the help of the above-mentioned stones a mountain was raised of a thousand paces in height not only pozzoli and the neighboring country were full of this mud but the city of naples also so that many of its palaces were defaced by it this eruption lasted two nights and two days without intermission though not always with the same force the third day the eruption ceased and i went up with many people to the top of the new hill and saw down into its mouth which was a round cavity about a quarter of a mile in circumference in the middle of which the stones which had fallen were boiling up just as a cauldron of water boils on the fire the fourth day it began to throw up again and the seventh day much more but still with less violence than the first night at this time many persons who were on the hill were knocked down by the stones and killed or smothered with the smoke and now for nearly a century the whole district continued in repose nearly five centuries have passed since there has been any violent eruption of vesuvius itself and the crater seemed gradually assuming the condition of an extinct volcano the interior of the crater is described by braxini who visited vesuvius shortly before the eruption of sixteen thirty one in terms that would have fairly represented its condition before the eruption of seventy nine the crater was five miles in circumference and about a thousand paces deep its sides were covered with brushwood and at the bottom there was a plain on which cattle grazed in the woody parts wild boars frequently harbored in one part of the plain covered with ashes were three small pools one filled with hot and bitter water another salter than the sea and the third hot but tasteless but in december sixteen thirty one the mountain blew away the covering of rock and cinders which supported these woods and pastures seven streams of lava poured from the crater causing a fearful destruction of life and property Rosina, built over the site of herlachium was entirely consumed by a raging lava stream heavy showers of rain generated by the stream involved during the eruption caused in their turn an amount of destruction scarcely less important than the resulting from the lava streams for falling upon the cone and sweeping thence large masses of ashes and volcanic dust these showers produced destructive streams of mud consistent enough to merit the name of aqueous lava commonly assigned to it an interval of thirty-five years passed before the next eruption by sixteen sixty six there has been a continual series of eruptions so that the mountain has scarcely ever been at rest for more than ten years together occasionally there have been two eruptions within a few months and it is well worthy of remark that during the three centuries which have elapsed since the formation of monte nuvo there has been no volcanic disturbance in any part of the neapolitan volcanic district save in vesuvius alone of old as Brieslack will remarks there has been irregular disturbances in some part of the bay of naples once in every two hundred years the eruption of Solfatara in the twelfth century that of ischia in the fourteenth and that of monte nuvo in the sixteenth but the eighteenth has formed an exception to the rule it seems clear that the constant series of eruptions from vesuvius during the past two hundred years has sufficed to relieve the volcanic district of which vesuvius is the principal vent 
of the eruptions which have disturbed vesuvius during the last two centuries those of seventeen seventy nine seventeen ninety three and eighteen twenty two are in some respects the most remarkable sir william hamilton has given a very interesting account of the eruption of seventeen seventy nine passing over these points in which this eruption resembled others we may note its more remarkable features sir william hamilton says that in this eruption molten lava was thrown up in magnificent jets to the height of at least ten thousand feet masses of stones and sorry were to be seen propelled along by these lava jets vesuvius seemed to be surmounted by an enormous column of fire some of the jets were directed by the wind towards Ottajano. others fell on the cone of vesuvius on the outer circular mountain soma and on the valley between falling still red-hot and liquid they covered a district more than two miles and a half wide with a mass of fire the whole space above this district to the height of ten thousand feet was filled also with the falling and rising lava streams so that there were continually present a body of fire covering the extensive space i have mentioned and extending nearly two miles high the heat of this enormous fire column was distinctly perceptible at a distance of at least six miles on every side the eruption of seventeen ninety three presented a different aspect dr clark tells us that millions of red-hot stones were propelled into the air to at least half the height of the cone itself then turning they fell all around in noble curves they covered nearly half the cone of vesuvius with fire huge masses of white smoke were vomited forth by the disturbed mountain and formed themselves at a height of many thousands of feet above the crater into a huge ever-moving canopy through which from time to time were hurled pitch-black jets of volcanic dust and dense vapors mixed with cascades of red-hot rocks and scoriae the rain which fell from the cloud canopy was scalding hot dr clark was able to compare the different appearances presented by the lava where it burst from the very mouth of the crater and lower down when it had approached the plain as it rushed forth from its imprisonment it streamed a liquid white and brilliantly pure river which burned for itself a smooth channel through a great arched chasm in the side of the mountain it flowed with the clearness of honey in regular channels cut finer than art can imitate and glowing with all the splendor of the sun sir william hamilton had conceived adds dr clark that stones thrown upon a current of lava would produce no impression i was soon convinced of the contrary light bodies indeed of five ten and fifteen pounds weight made little or no impression even at the source but bodies of sixty seventy and eighty pounds were seen to form a kind of bed on the surface of the lava and float away with it a stone of three hundred weight that had been thrown out by the crater lay near the source of the current of lava i raised it up on one end and let it fall upon the liquid lava when it gradually sank beneath the surface and disappeared if i wished to describe the manner in which it acted upon the lava i should say that it was like a loaf of bread thrown into a bowl of very thick honey which gradually involves itself in the heavy liquid and then slowly sinks to the bottom but as the lava flowed down the mountain slopes it lost its brilliant whiteness a crust began to form upon the surface of the still molten lava and this crust broke into innumerable fragments of porous matter called scoriae underneath this crust across which dr clark and his companions were able to pass without other injury than the singeing of their boots 
the liquid lava still continued to force its way onward and downwards past all obstacles. On its arrival at the bottom of the mountain, says Dr. Clark, the whole current, encumbered with huge masses of scory, resembled nothing so much as a heap of unconnected cinders from an iron foundry, rolling slowly along, he says, in another place, and falling with a rattling noise over one another. After the eruption described by Dr. Clark, the great crater gradually filled up, Lava boiled up from below, and small craters, which formed themselves over the bottom and sides of the great one, poured forth lava loaded with scurry. Thus, up to October 1822, there was to be seen, in place of a regular crater form opening, a rough and uneven surface, scored by huge fissures, whence vapor was continually being poured, so as to form clouds above the hideous heap of ruins. But the great eruption of 1822 not only flung forth all the mass which had accumulated within the crater, but wholly changed the appearance of the cone. An immense abyss was formed, three-quarters of a mile across, and extending two thousand feet downwards into the very heart of Vesuvius. Had the lips of the crater remained unchanged, indeed, the depth of this great gulf would have been far greater, but so terrific was the force of the explosion that the whole of the upper part of the cone was carried clean away, and the mountain reduced in height by nearly a full fifth of its original dimensions. From the time of its formation the chasm gradually filled up, so that, when Mr. Scrope saw it, soon after the eruption its depth was reduced by more than a thousand feet. Of late Vesuvius has been as busy as ever. In 1833 and 1834 there were eruptions, and in 1856 another great outburst took place. Then, for three weeks together, lava streamed down the mountain slopes. A river of molten lava swept away the village of Circolo and ran nearly to the sea at Pont Madaloni. There were then formed ten small craters within the great one, but these have now united, see date of article, and pressure from beneath has formed a vast cone where they had been. The cone has risen above the rim of the crater, from which torrents of lava are poured forth. At first the lava formed a lake of fire, but the seething mass found an outlet and poured in a wide stream towards Ottajano. Masses of red-hot stone and rock are hurled forth, and a vast canopy of white vapor hangs over Vesuvius, forming at night when illuminated by the raging mass below, a glory of resplendent flame around the summit of the mountain. It may seem strange that the neighborhood of so dangerous a mountain should be inhabited by races free to choose more peaceful districts, yet though Herculaneum, Pompeii, and Stabi lie buried beneath the lava and ashes thrown forth by the Vesuvius, Portici, and Retsina, Torre de Greco, and Torre del Anzuyata have taken their place, and a very large population, cheerful and prosperous, flourishes around the disturbed mountain, and over the district of which it is the somewhat untrustworthy safety valve. It has indeed been well pointed out by Sir Charles Lyell that the general tendency of subterranean movements when their effects are considered for a sufficient lapse of ages, is eminently beneficial, and that they constitute an essential part of that mechanism by which the integrity of the habitable surface is preserved. Why the working of this same machinery should be attended with so much evil is a mystery far beyond the reach of our philosophy and must probably remain so until we are permitted to investigate not our planet alone and its inhabitants, 
but other parts of the moral and material universe with which they may be connected could our survey embrace other worlds and the events not of a few centuries only but of periods as indefinite as those with which geology renders us familiar some apparent contradictions might be reconciled and some difficulties would doubtless be cleared up but even then as our capacities are finite while the scheme of the universe must be infinite both in time and space it is presumptuous to suppose that all sources of doubt and perplexity would ever be removed on the contrary they might perhaps go on augmenting in number although our confidence in the wisdom of the plan of nature might increase at the same time for it has been justly said by sir humphrey davy that the greater the circle of light the greater the boundary of darkness by which it is surrounded from the cornhill magazine march eighteen sixty eight end of section fifteen recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c